Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is where you get to meet your scientific editors. This is going down the scientific editor series. And I'm very happy to have scientific editor Dieter Hartman with us today. Hi, Dieter. Hi, Frank. How are you doing? I am doing well on this August 30th of 2021. And I'm in Phoenix and it's cloudy today on the summer. And where are you located at? Well, I am living in the upstate of South Carolina. And if you remember your shape of South Carolina, it looks like a piece of pizza pie. And mm -hmm. just in the tip of it, in the Appalachian Mountains foothills, nice. that's where I'm located, waiting for Ida rain to appear. Ah, yes, days. yes, yes, yes. We're in the, the storm season of the year as we come into fall. Very cool. So how is, uh, how is summer there in general? Has it been particularly hot or wet this year? No, I mean, you know, in, in South Carolina, where I live, it's, it's a little bit better because it's high up in elevation. So it's not like the coastal, you know, warmer areas. It's, it's usually humid and, and hot in the summer, but it's a rural environment. Clemson is a small college town of about 10,000 people with 20,000 students. So, you know, it's, the environment is not big city. It's mm -hmm. a small college and we have lots of space. And so my house is spacey. And so it's easy to tolerate the summers. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're taking a look at part of your spacey house there. So you must be in your home office or something. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see, Dieter, what do you like to do for research? Well, sort of by originally when I studied in Germany, uh, I worked on the equation of state of supernova matter, which is nuclear physics and sort of heavy duty nuclear stuff. Okay. But then I made a transition to the United States, uh, to UC Santa Cruz, where I worked, continued working on supernovae for a while. And, um, and eventually, since I worked with Stan Woosley as my advisor there, I had to make a choice between supernovae and another phenomenon, which was really hot in those days. Which, that was in 1983. Okay. And uh, this was about 10 years after the phenomenon of gamma ray burst had uh, been discovered. Yeah. And there were lots of crazy ideas around. And so I found them really exciting. And cool. then I engaged in it. And ever since then, I've become a high energy astrophysicist, gamma ray astronomer. And one of my specialties is gamma ray bursts, all aspects of them. So, Very nice. So, so along those lines, that's what I like to, to still do. I work on some theoretical aspects, afterglow observations, uh, proposing new missions for observing either the polarization of their of their proms radiation, or maybe finding the highest redshift GRBs to use them as light sources to probe the, the, the early universe, or can be cosmology with gamma ray bursts. So my, my area of interest is pretty broadly centered around, you know, from do we understand GRBs to what can we use them for? And in that sense, it's a little bit like supernovae, like, like the type 1As, which we try to understand, but we also have standardized them, so we're using them as cosmological probes or cosmological tools as distance indicators. So that theme, uh, you know, the, the gamma ray astronomy, gamma ray lines, also uh, the explosive nuclear synthesis, radioactivities. And of course, you and I have a nice common history on, on what to do with aluminum 26 and those isotopes <laughs> that make the galaxy glow in gamma ray. So basically everything gamma ray is of interest to me. Very cool, very cool. I didn't know you worked on nuclear equations of state in the past, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, what was your very first AAS journal article, APJ, AJ, whatever it may be? Yeah, so, so uh, working on my undergraduate degree, I published one paper in a European journal just before leaving for the United States. And then working at UC Santa Cruz with Stan, I worked with him on, uh, on the topic of very nutrient rich matter, which is still the material that is deep inside stars. And this is nuclear statistical equilibrium of very nutrient rich material. It's sort of that zone that is between what becomes a neutron star and what gets ejected. And that was my very first FJ paper to get together with my then advisor, Monique Alaite from Lebanon, and the soon to become my advisor, Stan Woosley. So the three of us wrote this paper. And I'm very proud of it. And just the other day, I was going in my office and I was checking to some old, and I saw the original a plotter printouts for the drawings that went into that paper. <laughs> the gullies, yeah. Maybe, right. maybe a year later. Absolutely cool. So people, we will put a, a link to Dieter's first article in the description below the video, so check it out. You'll probably find a burst of citations all of a sudden to your original first article, so. That would be much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, <clears throat> so time went on and you certainly published more than one article. You've published many articles in the AAS journals. And at some point, uh, I'm curious uh, how the opportunity to become a scientific editor arose and why you chose to become a scientific editor. Um, so I think for me, it was relatively uh, easy to make the decision because being on tenure track, being sort of a professor at a university, the academic career track typically involves research, funding, teaching, service, these are the pillars of how you get evaluated. Yep. And the place like Clemson University, like many, like most others, I would think, uh, expect faculty to do service, which is service to the community, the academic community, maybe even your local community too, and sort of service to your society. And along those lines, you know, you can do things like serve on a curriculum committee. And I find committee work really boring and, and frustrating. So having a service component, serving the community by being an UPJ editor was great because it satisfied that requirement while forcing me literally to do things that I wouldn't do every day, either in the context of teaching or research. You know, it, it made me look at papers and evaluate and think about it. So I thought this was a very good way to do sort of continued education of my own understanding of astrophysics. So it was a, it was a big, heavy, time-consuming job. Um, that I fell in love with really over the years, and I've been doing it for a while, as you know. <laughs> and um, but it, but it's I enjoy it because it's a great process of interacting with authors and interacting with editors and, and fellow editors like you um, to talk about the publication process and helping people get published. And maybe we can talk more about it. But my beginnings were simply saying, what can I do for service that I will enjoy? And so that's how I decided to put in my name in a hat, and I got lucky. I was selected. Uh, so that would have been, so you hinted at it, but I'll ask. Um, so how long have you been a scientific editor? Um, I, I don't know exactly. It's about 10 years now. So, you know, I, I have to look up the exact day, but it's approximately 10 years. Mm -hmm. And what happens is typically these, these positions last for three years and, and then you move on. Uh, and in my case, after the first term was over, the, the AAS made a lot of changes in the publication structure and the promotion of the journals and the relationship. And so the AS had a task force and I was interested in the pub business and participated in that. And we made a transition from the University of Chicago Press to, to other publishers. Right. And that was a complicated transition time. So the request was made that I hang on, so I decided to hang on. And so I strung it on a few more times. And at this point I feel it's so, you know, it's part of my life really. It has become part of my daily routine that I, don't feel the need to say, okay, I had it, it's enough of it, you know, it's the comfortable aspect of my academic day. <clears throat> but, but yeah, it's been 10 years already, which is longer than normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, three years is typical, some people stay mm -hmm. six, and if you go past that, you're kind of a lifer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's something to it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, I can relate to, to what you're saying. I mean, my, uh, my original motivation for doing it was, um, you know, I developed a, a, a habit of reading the journals as, as a graduate student um, a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, as time went on, I found myself reading the journals less and less as time went on, just because, you know, life goes on, you've got more duties, more things going on. And I really didn't like that. Um, and so when the opportunity arose to become a scientific editor, I thought, yeah, this is a great way to, you know, um, read the journals, uh, not forcibly, but, you know, okay, I'm going to start, you know, re-getting back into the depth that I was used to. And so I really enjoyed that. And I still- I, I think you, you, you're you making a good point <coughs> by emphasizing the depths to which you go into, right? I mean, we often, and I even teach my students to do sort of superficial reading, quickly capturing in essence to make a decision whether or not you want to read the paper in more depth. But it's rare that you have the luxury to, to dig in really deep. And as an editor, you have to go deep enough to really understand the issues. Yep. And that also means you're learning things about why did they do the research and what were the concerns? What are the issues? What about statistics? You name it. So you go a little bit deeper than just superficially reading a title. Indeed. And I find that most valuable because it tells me where I'm lacking something occasionally or where I should spend more time or things I simply miss, you know, just because you said you have too many things to do. And, 
So uh, you can't do it for every single paper ever published, not even in my area of, not even on gamma ray bursts can I read every paper. So when I have a, a burst, a paper that is on my desk that say you sent to me and I'm looking at it and say then, okay, so how much more do I need to do before I can assign it to a, to, you know, to a referee? And so that's a good, it's, I find it a very fun process really. Yeah. So the, for those of you who are curious, uh, so Dieter and I were both working in the high energy and uh, fundamental physics corridor. Uh, and in general, Dieter will take uh, the GRB uh, papers. He takes other ones uh, as well, according to the expertise he lined out earlier. Um, but yeah, we both work in this, in this corridor. And so, yeah, very cool. Um, so for those who don't know and who might be curious, um, what actually does a scientific editor do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, what's a sort of what's a typical day for you as you go through your science? Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. I've always wondered about it. What am I doing? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I, I see. I very don't know. Just <laughs> reject, 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 reject. There, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Well, if that were the case, right, that would be a horrible job to have. So, so I have. Uh, you know, it's it's a community of authors who would like to have their work, their results published and make available in a refereed fashion, in other words, peer approved. So there's a process. Mm -hmm. The society would like to brag about its accomplishment by its professional members to publish. And the process by which you do that is of course involves judgments and therefore referees look at your work. And that process cannot, I think, not easily be done by a robot or simply giving it to a referee to do the sums up, sum down. I think there needs to be a, a moderator or a facilitator. Uh -huh. So the way I look at the editors is my first option is to understand the paper enough so that I can think about who are the people out there that might be good referees for this source of their knowledge. And the ones that I know may not have a conflict of interest, not just being not at the same institution, but also maybe hating each other. I go to a conference, two groups are fighting, you know, then I obviously don't pick a referee from the enemy list and things like that. So to make sure you make a good choice. And then when the re reports come in, you know, some referees, we all have personalities. They, they produce reports which are not acceptable language-wise, or they're too harsh, or maybe they're insufficient. They're just too short saying, well, oh, the paper is interesting, but I don't like it, so we'll reject. Well, that's a report that nobody can make anything yeah, with. So I'm a facilitator. I'm supposed to make sure the process works. Good. So I have to help the referees to produce a good product, read it, analyze it, potentially edit it, and share it with the authors and say, could you please do these things and maybe address this one especially and also check on your language and also do this. And so then they do it and it comes back. I'll make sure that their language is correct. So I'm sitting between these two, right? Between authors and, um, and the referees. And I make sure that the process is proper, professional, smooth, productive, you name it. And in the, in the process, realize that I'm dealing with people. I've always liked dealing with people and potential conflicts or issues. And I, my role is to basically make sure when a paper is solid, in other words, it has a new result, it's error free, that it gets evaluated properly and it sees the light of publication. That's what I want to accomplish, right? Otherwise I take my personality out of the whole thing. I may or may not like the conclusion in the paper, but that's obviously not the issue. Right. My issue is process. And uh, so, so I think this is what I have learned to, um, to sort of establish a, a role, a, a function that enables, um, and I communicate that, and sometimes also don't understand, but I communicate to them that it is my role not to have a personal judgment. I have to rely on referees, and that could go wrong. The process sometimes goes wrong, and I might have to ask a second referee, or the authors feel the referee is biased. Well, I'm pretty sure it's not. Or maybe you have to call the referee back and say, why did you have this opinion? What's going on? So there is some labor that is involved in making sure one understands why an evaluation is the way it is. And you know, if you, you teach, I teach, for those of us who teach, one of the aspects is to quote unquote, put a grade, a label on a performance on a student, right? Which is the worst thing of, of teaching. We would like to share knowledge and transfer it and maybe even measure whether we succeeded but giving a student an A, B, or C is um, sort of an aspect that has to be done with great care, I think, because it's a personal judgment and the authors feel offended if you give their paper a failing grade and don't have a good reason for it, right? So, so therefore one has to be uh, somewhat educated and paying attention, constantly learning for what works and what doesn't work. 
And there, I feel my 10 years of doing this job has let me come across just about all kinds of options. Everything in my life you know, has happened. Indeed. And so I'm prepared now for, for this one. So, but basically the author should know that an editor is there to facilitate the process and to, to assist. It's not there to, to cast judgment, it's just to help with the process. Perfect, lovely, that's great. And you know, it still surprises me even after 10 years of doing this, new things still arise. You think you've seen yeah. it all and you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> things come up and you go, oh my gosh, how did this arise? Um, yeah. You could have said, I've seen much, but uh, not all. <laughs> So you kind of hinted on it a little bit. And so let me let me bear down a little bit on it. Um, what do you think makes for a good, solid initial submission to the journals? Well, I would say for, for a group or a person to decide to submit a paper to the Astrophysical Journal in particular, but to all referee journals, is you have to assess what you have accomplished. You've done some work whether it's observational or theoretical, doesn't matter. You found the result. You, you already made sure that you fully agree that you made no mistakes, right? You checked on statistics, you double check your apparatus and you, you, know, you do what you do for proper research. And then you find that, you know, that it turns out funny enough, blue stars have higher temperatures than red stars. And you find that's new and it's so exciting that you want to get it published. So you want to see, is there something new? Because if it's not new, then chances are the journal doesn't want to see your result. So is, is there a new contribution to the knowledge base that you're all creating? It has to have an element of advancement. If there's nothing new in it, if it's a rehash of something old or rediscovering something, it's not likely to be successful. And if it is new, and if you feel it is done error-free, then you want to communicate it concisely, right in a way that is makes it fun to read, right? Don't drag on forever, make, make clear statements. Think about the structure of your paper and sort of learn how to write a technical paper. Mm. It's, it's a piece of art, believe it or not, right? It's a bunch of equations, it's technical stuff, but at the same time, you really want to tell the story, you know, the history of all the light in the universe ever produced. Hey, that's already a title of, of a paper I want to read. Oh and then you, then you talk about this. <laughs> so that's what I would say, simply be, be aware of, if you have something to say, make sure you know how to say it, and then your submission is likely to succeed. Cool. So let's, um, let's dig into the process a little bit. So we'll cover it both from the author and, and referee perspective. Uh, what tips do you have for authors about the peer review process? I would say from my own experiences, as well as guiding the process as an editor, authors need to have a positive attitude towards a, a report. If you make the assumption the referee is not a mean person, but rather looked at your paper and has valid points to make, you should read them, understand them, acknowledge them, and then try to act on them. Don't say, oh my God, the referee is biased, didn't like my work, is negative. No, you should respond in a, in a, with a positive attitude. And it helps when you realize that the editor is on your side. The editor also looks at the report and already has made sure it's not a bias or anything, right? And if there's a lot of things and some editors write five pages of details, okay, that's a pain in the behind, but in an other say, well, everything is kind of okay, but fundamentally your assumption of one plus one equals two is on shaky grounds and you might want to rethink it. So whatever the criticism might be, Address it is the positive attitude. There you go. That's, that's my biggest advice that I can give. And of course, make an effort to seriously revise the paper. Don't do superficial. Okay, I'm going to add a word or a phrase and it's probably good enough. No. What do you really need to do to address the issues? And then Very good. Yep, absolutely. Do. Let's go take it from the other side. Uh, what tips do you have for referees? regarding the peer review process? So I see my internet is a little unstable, so hopefully I'm not- Yeah, it was okay, you, just, you, you blicked out for a second, but we're good. So, yeah. so what, I'll repeat it. Uh, no, I, heard, I heard the question about the referees. So <laughs> I would 
See, I was lucky as a grad student uh, working with Dan Wiesel in Santa Cruz. He engaged me on occasion in a paper that he saw I can understand enough to be the referee, to give him what I would do as a referee. Like he, he, he was a referee, but he said, take a look at it. What would you, see what do you find? And I said, well, how do I do it? Now, what's the idea? And he said, well, you, you start with a good attitude. You start by looking at a paper and say, let me see what's good about it. What are the exciting things? What, what's new? All the exciting stuff. And then you read it again and see if there's maybe something missing or something. Mm -hmm. So start positive as an attitude. That was sort of the, the advice he gave me uh, ever since then I refereed papers with that idea. Let me, let me see, first of all, why this is an exciting paper before I become critical. Okay. Since you open that uh, hmm. topic, we can go there for a second. Um, do you use, have you used graduate students for referees? Uh, actually, it turns out I personally have not involved my own grad students. It mm -hmm. might have been that they weren't ready for it or something. I'm yep. not opposed to it. And on rare occasions, I uh, do ask graduate students, advanced graduate students, typically the mm -hmm. ones that already have a publication in FJ, and I know their knowledge and I know what they have done. They're not yet PhDs, but they're so advanced that they are basically can start the process. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I sometimes even ask graduate students to be referees. Mm -hmm. But it is rare because typically that doesn't work together well. But locally, my own students, I haven't asked them to, but I've, we talked about it in our seminars. I explained to them, you know, what, what I do. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly shy about using advanced graduate students, either because certainly they have to have published as a, a lead author. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and for those uh, who agree to be the referee, and it is their first time um, reviewing a paper, uh, I always request that they go uh, over their at least their initial report with a veteran of the process, e.g. their advisor, um, before they submit their initial report. Because um, it is a little bit different from the author and um, referee. Well, occasionally what can happen is that you ask senior person X, to do it and the person said, well, you know, but my grad students could do a much better job. And I take a look at the grad student, they look at their publication record and they say, I'm perfectly happy if you let the grad student uh, do it, but maybe you can assist the grad student in the process, right? Then it involves those two together. And that's one of the best ways to teach them the, how the process works. Right, because none of us, <clears throat> none of us take, um, you know, there's no formal training on how to be a referee. Right. And so, uh, you know, you, you you learn it from other people who are veterans of the process. And so right. that's why we'll do that. So very on good. the job training. <laughs> on the job training. There you go. Um, let's see. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to share with the community um, about the editorial or peer review process? Yeah. So, I mean, maybe one more thing on the referees. Okay. Um, you know, in addition to the positive attitude, um, so depending on how senior the, the referee is, I may get more engaged. So the younger person, I might even say, do you want to talk about what I expect you to do? Or, mm -hmm. or when the report comes and I'm not quite happy, then I might say, can I call you to discuss the report because I'm lacking something, you know, because you want there to be guidance for the authors and maybe that's not given. So I try to spend a little more time on the training side of things. But I always, uh, when that comes up, I tell the, the referee is, it is so important that you realize why you're doing it. It's a service to the community. You're helping a paper be error-free if at all possible. No, nobody you know, can say this is error-free by definition. There's always a possibility something slips through, but obviously you're working really hard. You're checking the equations, you, some, whatever it is, but then how do you say it? What is your message, your style by which you explain to the authors that they need to fix equation two? You know, you wouldn't say things like, well, you know, equation two is utterly wrong or is total baloney. You know, you clearly would like to be a bit more, you know, nice. Just learn to express gently to make that. And also, yeah, okay. So, so basically, if I have the feeling that, that in, a referee hasn't done that him or herself by saying, okay, you know, and they're, they're good because they can look at their own performance. If they're struggling with it, I will try to give them feedback in the process so that they become better referees. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And the, the other thing that I uh, could maybe add in general is when you submit a paper to the society, there is a structure, right? You have to understand a little bit how publishing works and that's why people watch these videos. Who are those editors? What do they do? And it, it starts by selecting the branch in the journal. We have staff, right? And we have people that look at things and check that it's technically correct. And by the way, you know, our staff and the Janice Sexton, for example, who interacts with me maybe once every day, or you know, if not more often, yes. um, helping me out with something. There's lots of technical things having to do with some latex, and we have a producer staff and staff. So there's lots of people that are involved in, in this one. And the authors are not sitting there putting a paper in a black box and hoping that someday it appears, right? You can monitor the process, you can ask questions. Yes. You can say you can make suggestions to the editor. You can say, and if this one, please don't select person X because that person is biased for one good reason. And here are three good options if you want to choose them. They're good because they know the theory or they've done my. So be in, be engaged, and you know, and if, if you don't get the report, feel free to write to an editor and say, I've been waiting for four weeks now, and I'm really getting desperate, or my season's of defense is coming up. How is my paper doing? We don't mind hearing from you and we like to communicate in return. So just simply be engaged in the process. That's what I would say. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the purposes of these videos, people, <laughs> is to introduce you to the scientific editors. They, they are people and they're handling your, your, your <laughs> manuscripts as they go through the process. Uh, and you, should, as Dieter said, you should feel free to, to reach out to the scientific editor, either as an author or a referee yeah. uh, about the particular process. It's, it's, it's a human driven thing. <laughs> And we are humans. We're not AI boards. Um, and so go ahead and reach out about the status of your paper or, you know, discuss any aspect of it. So it's very cool. Well, Frank, as, as you know, since in, a, in the old days before COVID, we used to meet on a, in person on a regular basis. We do it by internet these days. We do these, um, you know, what we learn sessions, right? We get together and talk yes. about <laughs> cases and do case studies. So we talk about it. And one of the things that it always come up that, you know, if somebody sees a paper on the archive, and that has a result in it, and, and it says submitted to AppJ, and has total objection or issues or something. Oh my God, these guys are scooping me or doing something or stealing my data or whatever is the issue. Yes. And so they want to reach out to the journal and find the editor in chief and then the, the lead editor and eventually the guy who may be in charge of the paper and saying, now stop this or bring this to the attention of the referee or, right. you know, and, and then we have to engage in facilitating the human human interaction, which is now stressful but somebody feels hurt by something, right? right. So one, one should never forget, this is not a, an, an algorithm that gets unleashed. It's people. <laughs> it's, it's a human endeavor. It's the game we play. Yeah. Um, and so feel free to be human and reach out to those people. So to the editors, so yeah, absolutely. Um, shoot, you mentioned something I was gonna comment on and then it's, I spaced it. <laughs> uh, wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Uh, so one thing you might want to send out, Frank, is to everybody who watches these things, should say, well, maybe someday when I'm accomplished enough, ooh, I should ooh, consider running for this position, right? Ooh, Volunteering. Ooh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, consider it um, as, you, as you go through. Um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's, you know, one has to be established a little bit uh, in, in, in that's mainly as a protection mechanism. Uh, it's why we do anonymous reviews, for example, uh, is as a protection mechanism, because uh, um, sometimes you do have to make decisions. Yeah. That uh, yeah, uh, a young person on tenure track yeah, would be. And if you're you know, a young graduate student or a postdoc, you know, yeah. your next position or your next grant or whatever it is, somebody you know, might be human and want to seek retribution. That's a very human attribute. <laughs> um, and so you need to be protected from that. And so this is why the people who are SEs are generally subtle a little bit and they're, they're not beyond reproach, but um, you know, they're, so this they're is next the one, right? This is the one big reason sort of you have a bit more senior in order to be in a position to not worry about how your next job depends on how you perform this particular job. Right. So protectionism, but there's, a, there's another one which I find incredibly important all the time. And, and that's why we select our editors to be somewhat more senior established within their communities is that you understand the community. You, you've been involved, you know who is who, you know who's doing what. Yeah. And if you didn't know, then you would only go by some 
publication record or some yeah. reference on Google, right? But if you do know which group does what which way, then you understand the players and you can select referees more appropriately. You can avoid conflicts and stuff. So in knowing your colleagues is yeah. an important aspect and the older you get, the more likely that is the case. Yeah, it just comes with time. <clears throat> you just learn the community and you learn you know, where the fields are and right. that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Dieter, I wanna thank you so much for spending uh, some time with us and discussing um, your scientific editor position and how the process uh, unfolds. So thank you. Oh, thank you, this was fun. Thanks for the invite and I enjoyed the chat. Thank you. That'll do. Thanks you everyone and- Bye bye from Clemson. <laughs> Goodbye Clemson. <laughs> I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we'll see you on the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>